Aaron, you think that's what it is? You think it doesn't like Max? Well. <laughs> All right. Brother, I swear they don't make these. I'm going to put this down just a little bit. I swear they don't make these Bibles as, as sturdy as they used to. You know what I mean? They just don't. Used to be able to take, you know, those old Bibles, used to, they used to be able to take some wear and tear. These, the bindings all start to go on them like, and I don't, rip them open or a lot of times they're doing like that either. It's just I don't think they make them as sturdy as they used to. I just don't think they, I don't know if there's a difference in the sewing or if you can get them sewn. This, this one here, the, the L, it, it, it's still rugged like that. But the, the I don't need this. Oh, Cold in here. Very precious to see once you can get the right text for the quality of the bindings. It's cold, Brother Aaron. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll look at it, brother. I'm gonna I might have to get a well, I get a different one for street preaching, maybe. Yeah, that'd be nice. When we grow up we can do that. Someday we'll grow up. All right, well listen. Um this sounds a little echoey. Does it sound that way to you? Is it too loud? Or is it just fine? Is it okay back there? I can't tell. It just sounds like I'm inside of a bottle and I'm talking right now. I can hear myself. I don't like the way I sound. <laughs> can you turn them the other way? I'm getting a complex. <laughs> I'm bouncing off the walls. Right towards you. I'm telling you, that's right. Brother Aaron's been busy. Thank Brother Finney. Thank the Lord for Brother Finney. He sent us a laptop that we were using that he wasn't using anymore that he had there, and he, Brother Aaron, worked all weekend to scrub that thing completely down. He reinstall the system into it, and I mean he's just been working on it like crazy. So we thank the Lord for that. Well, I'll give you a few announcements here. Just um, good thing, a blessing. Uh, Lee and Carrie had their baby, so. Uh, um, Nine pounds, yeah. Wow! Is that a lot? Wow! For her it is. That's nothing. <laughs> Brother Paul's like, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's because you're a guy. That's why that's nothing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but praise the Lord, uh, everybody's healthy and, and doing fine. And I think she gets released today, maybe. I'm not sure, or Monday. I can't remember. Um, when that is exactly, but just uh, Isaiah Leland, little Isaiah Leland. So, yeah, he didn't. You know, he didn't tell us the name. He didn't call me on. He went in on. They, she went in on Thursday, so he calls me like Friday afternoon. I was like, and he wasn't even talking about that. He goes, "Oh, I was over at your house, and I seen this dehydrator in the driveway, and I was gonna take it." I was like, "Well, don't take it. It's mine." But uh, and then he's talking to me for like a half an hour. You know, and then I, I said, oh, by the way, I mean, how's Carrie doing? You know, where's she at? Oh, yeah, we had a boy. Yeah. No, just, yeah. I go, well, when did you have the, when, when did that happen? Oh, yesterday. Well, why didn't you call me? Oh, well, I didn't know, we didn't know the name, so we decided not to tell anybody. What, are you afraid we were going to influence your name or what? Like, we'll, we'll name the baby for you. But uh, anyway, I don't know what happened, but. Uh, I was giving him a hard time about that, but anyway, so everybody's doing well. I better, brother, I better lock these wheels down. I'm telling you, oops, look at that. You know what happens? I don't lock those things down, brother. Look at that, huh? Look at that. All right. Anyway, so you you pray for Carrie that. Uh, she has full recovery there and gets back on her feet and pray for Lee and them and 
If any ladies want to make any food for him and take it over there to him, that'd be nice too. Uh, just try to remember to do, do something special for them and uh, keep them in your prayers. Uh, pray for Brother Russ and them over there at uh, Family Bible Baptist. That's where uh, Rachel and Jessica are today. They went over there to visit. So they're, they're over there today. Just uh, pray for them. Safety for everyone traveling. And uh, that family, uh, the Roller family has come back like, every, you know, two or three times now. So uh, they moved to New Richmond and they, they wanted a church. So it's a blessing. Amen. So you just keep them in prayer and uh, let the Lord deal with deal with hearts over there because uh, in that area. And pray for Brother Nate. He's been sick for a few days. Uh, hopefully he's on the mend. I don't know. I, I think he is. He, I seen a little bit of activity out of him this morning on Facebook, so I think he's getting better. But he was pretty sick. He had a fever and all kinds of stuff. So just pray for him. Uh, he's he's doing better. But they have a showing on Monday. Yeah. So they've only had it up for Monday. Will be a week that they've had the house up. So pray for him as uh, as they they have that that showing and just, just pray gets sold. Amen. Pray gets sold and they're ready to move on. Amen. And get here. So you pray that all goes well with that and, you know, that everything goes through fine. That'd be a blessing. Uh, and uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that we need to pray for. Uh, not that anything uh, that I can remember specifically right this second. But um, had a lot of good contacts this week from folks online that uh, that have been listening and, and – uh, some folks that threw away some Hollywood movies and some other things and got rid of got rid of some things and um, got some things right. They listened to that Hollywood Satanic Roots and um, had some folks contact us from a lot of different places. And one family in Las Vegas, you pray for them. There's no there isn't a good church around them where they're trying to find one. They've been to a lot of them and they just haven't been able to find one. And uh, so they're following our ministry right now and they're listening right now. Uh, Pray for the Hill family, and uh, they, they they sent a testimony about Hollywood and such this last Wednesday, and uh, they're, they're also uh, he sent his testimony uh, about when they were both saved and everything, and they they sent it to us, and they're really learning a lot from our ministry here, so we praise the Lord for that as well. All right, well listen, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 17. This is going to be an interesting day today, a little different probably than than. Uh, than what than what you're used to. I mean, it's just a little bit different. So, um, we're going to talk about the origins of Islam. We're going to talk about Rome uh, and the origins of Islam. And you say, why do we need to cover that? Well, there's two billion Muslims in the world today that are deceived. They are deceived. They are dead in trespasses and sins. They are people for whom Christ was sent for. Amen? And uh, the Bible says Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the sinner. Amen? And they're sinners. Um, and they need Jesus Christ to save them. But they need the truth. They need to understand that they've been duped. They need to understand that Islam is mystery religion repackaged. That's all it is. And I'm going to prove that to you today. In three sessions, I'm going to prove to you that it's nothing but Roman Catholicism. It's nothing but the mystery of iniquity that doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. It's the same thing. It's the same mystery. It's just a little bit of, of, of creative packaging. All right? It's really not that creative, to be honest with you. It's rather lame. But, uh, uh, but to people that have been steeped into that, uh, they, they don't see that. Now listen, I don't hate Muslim people. On the contrary, um, I want them to be saved. Just like Roman Catholics. When I, tell you, when, I, when I preach against Roman Catholicism and I preach against the papacy, I'm not preaching against the Roman Catholic people. Do you understand? They are dead in trespasses and sins. They are fooled. I, I don't hate them. I'm not mad at them, okay? I, I don't wish any ill towards them. I want them to be saved. I want them to come to the knowledge of the truth that they might be saved. That's what's different about it. You, you have a world today that is, listen, you are being, today you are, the fires are being stoked to eradicate Muslims. That's really what's going on. You, you don't see that unless you understand the plan. 
If you get what the plan is, and, and um, uh, what's his face, uh, Albert Pike, he wrote about that in World War III. He said what, what he said would happen. Brother, Brother Anthony, you read that, didn't you? How, he, how he, said, he said that they would come together and they would, they would eradicate the Muslims and the Jews would just kind of kill off each other. They would get in this huge battle and, uh, and everything like that. And that's what would happen. That's what they want to happen. See, they want a war to wipe out Muslims and they want white Americans to hate Muslims. That's what they want. Because they, 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 they want this confederacy to come together and a certain group of Muslims be completely wiped out. But you only will understand that once you get these three pieces of the puzzle that I give you today, okay? That's why I'm going to give you one today, one this morning, one in the next hour, and one this afternoon. By the time you get all three of those together, and you say, well, I don't believe, you might come at, when I, when I teach this one to you right here, you might say, I don't believe that. Okay? Well, just hold it in your mind and let's move on to the next sort of evidence, okay? And you might say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, well, then just hold that in your mind, too, and, and contemplate some of those things. And then move on to number three. And then put all three of them together and then weigh the evidence and say, hmm, I think we have a makings of a conspiracy here. It, it appears to me that there is a desire from the devil to trap two billion people and send them straight to hell. See, it's bigger than waving an American flag. It's bigger than patriotism. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's only, I want you to understand something. I'll make it very clear. There's only two religions in the world. There is the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. Christ come in the flesh, the Savior, God Almighty. Or there is number two, there is the devil that is to come and his antichrist, which we're going to talk about a little bit. I, I might have to preach another message to you directly on the 12th imam because I, I, I have some pushback when I put that on. I put, I put something on my Facebook page. I said, you know, the 12th imam is really the antichrist. And he is, and I'm going to prove it to you. All of the things that they espouse, they, 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 all the attributes of the 12th Imam are that of the Antichrist. It's amazing. When you listen to their writings and who they're describing, they're describing the Antichrist. That's who they're, that's who they're talking about. Just like when other cults. See, Islam is the second biggest mystery religion on the planet. Second biggest. Second only to Rome, its mother. That's it. Rome is the first, Islam is the second mystery religion. And it, it wields billions of people. And it's powerful. It's a powerful deception. All right, let's get into it. Revelation chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee, unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Verse number 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. See, Rome is that great whore. The spirit, let me, let me start by saying this, and I'll probably reiterate this to you in another message here too today, but the spirit of Babylon rested in Rome. The spirit of the mystery religions rested in Rome. You have to understand that. That's where Mystery Babylon was around before Rome. Okay? I've had somebody say it to me the other day, well, you don't know what you're talking about because Babylon, mystery Babylon's been around before Roman Catholicism. Well, sure it has. I never denied that. Go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. There it is. World domination. See, stop looking for names and look at their attributes. Look at what they produce. Look at the fruit that they have. You're looking at names. I'm going to show you the origins of Islam today. And when I show you this, stop looking just for... Well, they didn't call it Islam back then. They didn't have to call it Islam. They're describing... It's like the 12th Imam. I said, they're describing... Well, show me in the Bible where the 12th Imam is the Antichrist. Let us be the dumbest statement I've ever heard. First of all, the 12th Imam listed is not in the King James Bible, okay? I don't have to show you that. I can show you the, who they describe is in the Bible, and that's the Antichrist. People, it's not that difficult. I really get sick and tired of people trying to throw out things to stump you and to stall you and to get off the truth. And really what it is is to build up a hate for a group of people. That's what it's about. 
build up a hate for a group of people that's been that's been fomented and we fell for it in America. Think about this. After 9-11 hit, churches all over America rallying to go destroy Muslims. Think about God Almighty in heaven looking down upon that and seeing his church, seeing his churches, his people called by his name, wanting to eradicate a certain sect of people. Sad, isn't it? All right, well, the first testimony I want to give you today, I'm going to give you a testimony from a Jesuit, a former Jesuit priest. I'm going to give you his testimony, Alberto Rivera. Or is it, Riv yeah, Riv Rivera, right? Am I saying that right, Brother, Brother Aaron? Is it Riviera or is it Rivera? Rivera? Okay, I just, I don't know. If I mutilate his name, you know who he is. But uh, anyway... He won't mind. He's in heaven now, so he's fine with it. Amen. But I want to give you his testimony first. Alberto was a Jesuit priest. He was a high-level Jesuit priest inside the Vatican, and he was trained by a very high-level Jesuit priest named Augustine Villa. This man was a, a very a very high-level priest. Uh, he was a German Jesuit priest uh, this uh, Cardinal Bia was a German Jesuit priest and scholar at the Pontifical Gregorian University, specializing in biblical studies and biblical archaeology. He also served as the personal confessor of Pope Pius XII. He wasn't a, he wasn't a nobody, okay? He was an insider. And and he, this is his testimony. I'll read much of it to you. Then I want to show you some external evidences where you can see mystery Babylon there. He says this, what I'm going to tell you is what I learned in secret briefings in the Vatican when I was a Jesuit priest under oath and induction. A Jesuit cardinal named Augustine Bia showed us how desperately the Roman Catholics wanted Jerusalem at the end of the 3rd century because of its religious history and its strategic location. The holy city was considered a priceless treasure. It's very true. I'm going to show you evidences of that in the next hour. Augustine Bia was the, was the, the, uh, the man that taught him this. In 1959, Pope John the Thirteenth excuse me, Pope John the Twenty-Third made him a cardinal at the Catholic Church. He served as the first president of the Sectariat for Promoting Christian Unity. Oh, how about that, Christian Unity. From 1960 until his death, Bia was a leading biblical scholar and ecumenist who greatly influenced relationships with other Christians and Jews during the Second Vatican Council. Oh, how about that? Bia published several books, mostly in Latin, in 430 articles. Anyway, a scheme had to be developed to make Jerusalem a Roman Catholic city. They've, by the way, the Pope's always wanted to do that. He's always wanted a temple there where he could sit on that temple and say he is God. He has always wanted to sit there and say he is God. On that, Remember, what, what does he call himself? He's the vicar of God. He calls himself the vicar of Christ. He is God on earth. So the Bible talk, what, is it, what does the Bible talk about? It talks about a man will sit on the temple of God, saying it's in the temple of God, saying he is God. Now, some liken that to a final pope that will come to be Antichrist. I'm not going to disagree with that. I can't disprove it, and I can't prove it at this point. I will say it's fascinating, though, that there's a man in every generation that lives and stands up and says he's God. That's right. The poor Arabs fell victim to one of the most clever plans ever devised by the power of darkness. They would use the great untapped source of manpower that could do this job, and that was the children of Ishmael. Early Christians went everywhere with the gospel, setting up small churches, but they met with heavy opposition. Both the Jews and the Roman government persecuted believers in Christ to stop their spread. But the Jews rebelled against Rome, and in AD 70 AD, Roman armies under General Titus smashed Jerusalem and destroyed the great Jewish temple from which the heart of Jewish worship in fulfillment of Christ's prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 2. Remember that? He said they would come and they would be destroyed the temple. Jesus said that. They'll ride in. They're going to destroy the temple. On this holy place where the temple once stood, the Dome of the Rock Mosque stands today as Islam's second most holy place. Coincidental? Uh-uh. Happened on purpose. Just not the way the Pope intended it to happen. See, he intended that he was going to be the one to build that temple there. They would build it for him, and he would sit there on that temple saying he is God. 
but something happens when you give a couple million crazy people a lot of money, finances. You know what they do? They run around with Toyota trucks and Nike shoes and shoot people and behead people because you fund them to do it. Oh. And they might even be called ISIS. And how rich is that? Who's ISIS? Horus. Funny. Hot name to use. Not really. Makes a lot of sense. It's going to push a world war to eradicate a group of people for a handful of people that we've funded and given money to. Anyway, that's all free. It's not in, it's not in, uh, in the, Jesuit, uh, the former Jesuit priest's notes here, but I thought I'd add that in for clarity. Amen? All right, good. Make sure you're paying attention. Sweeping changes were in the wind. Corruption, apathy, greed, cruelty, perversion, and rebellion were eating at the Roman Empire. It was ready to collapse. The persecution against Christians was useless as they continued to lay down their lives for the gospel of Christ. The only way Satan could stop this thrust was to create a counterfeit Christian religion to destroy the work of God. The solution was in Rome. Their religion had come from ancient Babylon, and all it needed was a facelift. This didn't happen overnight, but began in the writings of the early Christian fathers. Early church fathers, excuse me. It was through their writings that, what a, new, that a new religion would take shape. The statue of Jupiter in Rome was eventually called St. Peter. How about that? And the statue of Venus was changed to the Virgin Mary. The site chosen for its headquarters was on the seven hills of, called Vaticanus. The place of a diving serpent where the satanic temple of Janus stood. Well, that wasn't in the history books. Nobody talked about that, did they? Remember what Jesus said? I know where Satan's seat is. Remember that? He said, I know where Satan's seat is. I know where he sits. The great counterfeit religion was Roman Catholicism called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. She was raised up to block the gospel, slaughter the believers in Christ, establish religions, create wars, and make the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication. As we will see. Three major religions have one thing in common. Each has a holy place where they look for guidance. Roman Catholicism looked to the Vatican and the holy city. The Jews looked to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and the Muslims looked to Mecca as their holy city. We don't seek a city here. That's right. Each group believes that they receive certain types of blessings for the rest of their lives for visiting their holy place. In the beginning, Arab visitors would bring gifts to the house of God, and the keepers of the Kaaba were gracious to all who came. Some brought their idols, and not wanting to offend these people, their idols were placed inside the sanctuary. It is said that the Jews looked upon the Kaaba as an outlying tabernacle of the Lord with veneration until it became polluted with idols. In a tribal contention over a well, Zamzam, that's what the well was called, the treasure of the Kaaba and the offerings that pilgrims had given were dumped down the well, and it was filled with sand. It disappeared. Many years later, Al Mutalib, I hope I'm saying his name right, but I don't know. It's really difficult. Was given visions telling him where to find the well and its treasure. He became the hero of Mecca, and he was destined to become the grandfather of Muhammad. Before this time, Augustine. How about that, Augustine? How about that guy? Remember him, Augustine, that heretic? Became the bishop of North Africa and was effective in winning Arabs to Roman Catholicism, including whole tribes. It was among these Arab converts to Catholicism that the concept of looking for an Arab prophet developed. Muhammad's father died from illness, and his sons born to great Arab families in places like Mecca were sent into the desert to be suckled and weaned and spend some of their childhood with Budoyan tribes for training and to avoid the plagues in the city. After his mother and grandfather also died, Muhammad was with his uncle when a Roman Catholic monk learned of his identity and said, now listen, here's how it started. Take your brother's son back to his country and guard him against the Jews. For by God, if they see him and know of him, that which I know, they will construe evil against him. Great things are in store for this brother's son of yours. So he's setting it up. They're stoking it. The Roman Catholic monk had fanned the flames for future Jewish persecution at the hands of the followers of Muhammad. 
The Vatican desperately wanted Jerusalem because of its religious significance, but was blocked by the Jews. Another problem was the true Christians in North Africa who preached the gospel. Roman Catholicism was growing in power, but would not tolerate opposition. We know that from history of the Baptists, that they slaughtered the North African Christians over there. They completely slaughtered them. Somehow the Vatican had to create a weapon to eliminate both the Jews and the true Christian believers who refused to accept Roman Catholicism. Looking to North Africa, they saw the multitudes of Arabs as a source of manpower to do their dirty work. Some Arabs had become Roman Catholic and could be used in reporting information to leaders in Rome. Others were used in an underground spy network to carry out Rome's master plan to control the great multitudes of Arab people who rejected Catholicism. When St. Augustine appeared on the scene, he knew what was going on. His monastery served as basis to seek out and destroy biblical manuscripts owned by true Christians. We know that to be true, don't we? From the history of the King James Bible, we understand those manuscripts and everything, that they sought out and they had to destroy those things. In the Vatican briefing, oh, wait, let me back up here, sorry. The Vatican wanted to create a Messiah for the Arab people, someone they would raise up as a great leader, a man with charisma whom they could train and eventually unite all non-Catholic Arabians behind him, create a mighty army that would ultimately capture Jerusalem for the Pope. In the Vatican briefi briefing, Cardinal Bia told us this story. A wealthy Arabian lady who was a faithful follower of the Pope played a tremendous part in this drama. She was a widow named Khadijah. She gave her wealth to the church and retired to a convent but was given an assignment. She was, a, she was very wealthy and she was taken to the... She gave up all of her fortune, gave it to Rome, and they sent her to a mon and she uh, joined and became a nun there. She was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. Khadijah had a cousin named Waruk, who was also a very faithful Roman Catholic, and the Vatican placed him in a critical role as Muhammad's advisor. He had tremendous influence on Muhammad. Teachers were sent to young Muhammad, and he had in intensive training. Muhammad studied the works of St. Augustine, which prepared him for his great calling. The Vatican and Catholic... Arabian people across North Africa spread the story of a great one who was about to rise up among the people and be the chosen one of their God. While Muhammad was being prepared, he was told that his enemies were the Jews and that the only true Christians were Roman Catholic. He was taught that the others calling themselves Christians were actually wicked imposters and should be destroyed. Many Muslims believe this. Muhammad began receiving divine revelations as his wife's Catholic cousin, Waruk, helped to interpret them. From this came the Quran. In the fifth year of Muhammad's mission, persecution came against his followers because they refused to worship the idols in the Kaaba. The Quran, Muhammad did not write the Quran. Jesuit priests wrote the Quran. Muhammad didn't write that. Muhammad instructed some of them to flee Abysnia, where Nigas, the Roman Catholic king, accepted them because of Muhammad's views on the Virgin Mary were so close to Roman Catholic doctrine. These Muslims received protection from Catholic kings because of Muhammad's revelations. Now listen, okay? I want you to understand something here. This is how this works. Muhammad left Mecca. And when he left Mecca, he went to this Catholic king. Now, why would a, a Roman Catholic king take in somebody who had a different religion like that unless he was confederate with it and they were working together for a cause. So you have to understand the Pope and his people had confessors that what these kings would confess to and that they would, they would control. This king was a Roman Catholic king and he supported Muhammad and he protected Muhammad and he kept Muhammad for a time and protected him so he could go and he could war and he could do what he was getting ready to do. Muhammad later conquered Mecca, and the Kaaba was cleared of idols. The Pope raised up his armies and called them crusades to hold back the children of Ishmael from grabbing Catholic Europe. See, what happened was <laughs> they, they got out of hand and they couldn't control them anymore. So then they had millions and millions and millions of Arabian people out there running around following this guy named Muhammad and, and his religion, and they were starting, I mean, they, they just took over. 
So the Pope raised up and, 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 and got the Catholic Crusades going. The Crusades lasted for centuries, and Jerusalem slipped out of the Pope's hands. Turkey fell, and Spain and Portugal were invaded by Islamic forces. In Portugal, they called a mountain called Fatima in honor of Muhammad's daughter, never dreaming it would become world famous. Years later, when Muslim armies were poised on the islands of Sardinia and Corsica to invade Italy, there was a serious problem. The Islamic generals realized they were far too extended. It was at this time they had peace talks. One of the negotiators was Francis of Assisi. Assisi. I don't know how to say that guy's name. Is, it, is he a, the, the, the sissy guy? Francis of Assisi, that guy. Right? That guy. Anyway, he was, I always say, I don't want to say his name. It just, it just reminds me of Assisi. Anyway, so that, that's, that's what he did. He negotiated with them. Why? Well, first of all, they knew they weren't going to take the Pope. They weren't going to take it, Rome. They weren't going to do that. And they were far too extended, and they knew they had to back up. And then they had to make some negotiations. So I'm going to tell you in another message the negotiations that they made because they're very fascinating. But, uh, and you'll get an understanding of what went on. As a result, Muslims were allowed to occupy Turkey in a Christian world, and Catholics were allowed to occupy Lebanon in the Arabian world. It was also agreed that the Muslims could build mosques, listen, in Catholic countries without interference, as long as Roman Catholics could flourish in Arab countries. That's usually not a problem, still today. Cardinal Bia told us in Vatican briefings that both the Muslims and Roman Catholics agreed to block and destroy the efforts of their common enemy, Bible-believing Christian missionaries. One, one identifying mark of Mystery Babylon will always be their hate for true Bible believers. That will be, they, they will always hate true Bible-believing Christians. They will always murder true Bible-believing Christians. What does the Bible say about that? It says she was drunk with the blood of the saints. That's an, that's an identifying uh, of, of Rome and her daughters, or Mystery Babylon and her daughters. The one thing you will see is an identifying mark of, of all of those is the fact that they desire the blood of the saints. All through history you can see it. Through these concordants, Satan blocked the children of Ishmael from a knowledge of Scripture and the truth. The Islamic community looks on Bible-believing missionaries as a devil who brings poison to the children of Allah. This explains years of ministry in those countries with little results. The Vatican also engineers a campaign of hatred between the Muslim Arabs and the Jews. Before this, they had coexisted peacefully. A light control was kept on Muslims from the Ayatollah down through the Islamic priests, nuns, and monks. By the way, I'm going to show you that these people are high-level Masons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, all these 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 uh, big big. I'm going to show you pictures of them. these these Muslim. They're masons. Oh yeah, they're shriners and they're masons and they're all working together. They have the same symbols, the same signs. They're in the same mystery religion. It's just repackaged to fit somebody else. The next plan was to. Uh, the next plan was to control Islam. In 1910, Portugal was going socialistic. Red flags were appearing in the Catholic Church, was facing a major problem. Increasing numbers were against the church. The Jesuits wanted Russia involved, and the location of the vision at Fatima could play a key part in pulling Islam to the mother church. In 1917, the Virgin appeared in Fatima. Well, how about that? I find it fascinating, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but that Muhammad worshipped in a cave and got visions in a cave, and so did the Pope. Interesting. Hanging out in caves. The mother of God was a smashing success playing to overflow crowds. As a result, the socialists of Portugal suffered a major defeat. Did you know that um, Mussolini was called the, the protector of Islam? Do you know that? There's a picture of him you can see, and he's on a, on a horse, and he's got a sword in his hand, and he's called the defender and protector of Islam. Hmm. Odd, isn't it? Not really. Not when you understand what's really going on. It's not odd at all. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense when you bring it back to two things. They're either mystery Babylon or godliness. It's either the spirit of disobedience or the spirit of Christ. There's no other. There's only two in the world. That's it. It's simplified. There's only two. 
Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholics worldwide began praying for the conversion of Russia, and the Je Jesuits invented the Novenus to Fatima, which they could perform throughout North Africa, spreading good public relations to the Muslim world. Yeah, I don't have time to get down the road of the Jesuits right now, but I've been doing a lot of studying on them. And, and I, when I bring you that series, it's going to bring a lot of things into perspective. But this is kind of a little piece that fit in the... Uh, before the, to kind of segue into that. The, the, the Arabians thought they were honoring the daughter of Muhammad, which is what the Jesuits wanted them to believe. They, Fatima, was, that was the daughter of Muhammad. They thought that's who they were honoring. It was a name. No, they were... They, 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 but also, the, the Muslims believe in the Immaculate Conception. And I'm going to cover that the next hour. I'm going to, cover, I'm going to preach a message you call the Immaculate Conception Deception. And I want you to, and, and then you will understand that, that Islam believes the same thing as Rome does. Same exact thing. Uh, the Arabs thought they were honoring the daughter of Muhammad. As a result of the vision of Fatima, Pope Pius XII ordered his Nazi army to crush Russia and the Orthodox religion and make Russia Roman Catholic. A few years after he lost World War II, Pope Pius XII started startled the world with his phony dancing sun vision to keep Fatima in the news. It was a great religious showbiz, and the world swallowed it. It's like they see Jesus in a bowl of spaghetti or something. Oh, it's just weird. One one person had like a one guy in New York had like a bowl of oatmeal or something. Said, "There's Jesus." I'm like, no, that's not Jesus. Jesus is not in your oatmeal, okay? You pantheistic weirdo. All right. <laughs> I'm so sorry. He's he's it's not in your oatmeal. And I hate to break it to you, Pope. He's not in your little little cookie either. Okay. He's not in that little. We're gonna talk about that little cookie God today. We're gonna talk about that. Because that sun fits exactly in the crescent moon, but we're gonna—I'm gonna show you that today. As a result, a group of followers has gone had had grown into Blue Army worldwide, holding millions of faithful Roman Catholics ready to die for the Blessed Virgin. But we haven't seen anything yet. The Jesuits have their Virgin Mary scheduled to appear four or five times in China, Russia, and major appearances in the U.S. What has this got to do with Islam? Well, note Bishop Sheen. Remember Bill, Bishop Fulton Sheen? Do you know who he is? Bishop Fulton Sheen was the handler, the Jesuit handler of Billy Graham. And for him and old Billy traveled on trains together, and they were just the best of friends. His little Jesuit handler that brought all the fame and fortune to him. And he was the go-between from him and Rome. That was, that was the, the go-between. Anyway, um, so Bishop Fulton Sheen's statement is this. Our Lady's appearance at Fatima marked the turning point in the history of the world's 350 million Muslims. After the death of his daughter, Mohammed wrote that she is the most holy of all women in paradise next to Mary. After the death of his daughter. Oh, after the death of his daughter. Okay. I thought it said after the death of Muhammad. I was like, that's kind of weird. Anyway, he believed that the Virgin Mary chose to be known as Our Lady of Fatima as a sign and a pledge that Muslims who believe in Christ's virgin birth will come to believe in his divinity. Bishop Sheen pointed out that the pilgrim virgin statues of Our Lady Fatima were enthusiastically received by Muslims in Africa, India, and elsewhere, that many Muslims are now coming into the Roman Catholic Church. History proves that before Islam came into existence, the Sabians in Arabia worshipped the moon god who was married to the sun god. Wasn't that interesting? You have the sun, and you have Islam as the moon. Crescent. It's perfect in their communion. When they do their when they do their table of devils, that's what they're doing. They're they're really perverted people, actually. History proves it before that anyway. So uh, let's see here. They gave birth to three goddesses, who were worshipped through the Arab world as daughters of Allah. An idol excavated at Hazar in Palestine in the 1950s shows Allah sitting on a throne with the crescent moon on his chest. We're going to talk about that crescent moon here. Muhammad claimed he had a vision from Allah and was told, you are the messenger of Allah. This began his career as a prophet, and he received many messages. By the time Muhammad died, the religion of Islam was exploding. The nomadic Arabian tribes were joining forces in the name of Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Some of Muhammad's writings were placed in the Quran, others were never published. They are now in the hands of high-ranking holy men ayatollahs in the Islamic faith. When Cardinal Bia shared this information with us in the Vatican, he said... These writings are guarded because they contain information that links the Vatican to the creation of Islam. Both sides have so much information on each other that if, it expo if it, they were exposed, it could create such a scandal that it would be a disaster for both religions. 
In their holy book, the Quran, Christ is regarded as an only a prophet. Yeah, Allah had no son. That's what they say. In their, in, that's in their holy book. If the Pope was his representative on earth, then he also must be a prophet of God. This caused the followers of Muhammad to fear and respect the Pope as, in, as another holy man. The Pope moved quickly and issued bulls, granting the Arabian generals permission to invade the, and conquer nations of North Africa. The Vatican helped to finance the building of these massive Islamic armies in exchange for three favors. Just three. Number one, eliminate the Jews and Christians. The latter were regarded as true believers, which they called infidels. Number two, protect the Augustinian monks and Roman Catholics. Makes sense. Number three, conquer Jerusalem for his holiness in the Vatican. Well, that one didn't quite go over so well. <laughs> that one didn't. That one didn't. Didn't. Go, and I believe the Lord allowed that to happen. See, I don't. I don't. I think God stopped that. I think the Lord stopped that from happening. I believe that. As time went by, the power of Islam became tremendous. Jews and true Christians were slaughtered, and Jerusalem fell into their hands. Roman Catholics were never attacked, nor were there shrines during this time. But when the Pope asked for Jerusalem, he was surprised at their denial. The Arabian generals had such military success that they could not be intimidated by the Pope. Nothing could stand by the way of their own plan. Under Warrock's direction, Muhammad wrote that Abraham offered Ishmael as a sacrifice. The Bible says that Isaac was a sacrifice, but Muhammad removed Isaac's name and inserted Ishmael's name. As a result of this, the Muhammad in Muhammad vision, the faithful Muslims built the mosque, the Dome of the Rock, in Ishmael's honor on the site of the Jewish temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. This made Jerusalem the second most holy place in the Islamic faith. How could they have give such a sacred shrine to the Pope without causing a revolt? The Pope realized that they had created what, what he had created was out of control when he heard they were calling his holiness an infidel. He didn't like that. <laughs> Got a little mad about that. If he ever met me, I'd call him a lot more. The Muslim generals were determined to conquer the world for Allah, and now they turn toward Europe. Islamic ambassadors approached the Pope and asked for papal bulls to give them permission to invade European countries. The Vatican was outraged. War was inevitable. Temporal power and control of the world was considered the basic right of the Pope. He wouldn't think of sharing it with those whom he considered heathens. So that's the end of, uh, of the Jesuit, I mean the Jesuit, the former Jesuit, Alberto Rivera, his testimony as to what he was told by a very high-level Jesuit priest in the Vatican, okay, and uh, Cardinal Bia and, and his, I mean, Cardinal Bia is a very high-level Jesuit, or was a very high-level Jesuit. You can see it, I mean, in his, his um, doctorates and everything that he had there and his, his, his training and everything. I mean, he, was, he knew what he was talking about. And he was specialized in biblical archaeology, okay, so the guy knew what was going on. See, one thing you have to understand, the Vatican holds all the secrets. They are, that's where the secrets of the arcane rest right there. This, all the secrets of the mystery religions all rest there. They know it all. And I'm going to preach a sermon to you sometime in the future because I think we, we don't understand things. See, we have an open Bible, right? So we have all the truth here. We don't hide anything, right? God doesn't hide the truth from us here. He gives it to us and he reveals it all to us. But the devil's kingdom is the opposite of that. The devil's kingdom is compartmentalized. So if you're a Jesuit, you know what you're told in that compartment. If you're, if you're a witch, you know what you're told in that mystery religion. You know what you are told there, and that's all that you, and you know everything. And you're not lying at most of what you're saying. If you come out of it and you get saved and they tell you what happened, they're not lying to you. That's what they know from the compartment that they've been locked in. The Masonic order, they're not lying to you. For the most part, those that come out and are saved and get born again, that, that's the compartment that they're in. It's all they've been told. But what sits high on top that mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, he, they know all the secrets. The black pope understands all of it. He knows all of it too well. So he's not confused. It. Now, now I want to give you some external evidence here. All right. We're making good time here. I'll keep you here till 4 or 5. We'll be set. All right. Um, some external evidence. I'm just kidding. I know it's your first day here. She's like... Really? We don't get to move for like four hours? I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> um, external evidence. The crescent moon of Islam in Rome. 
Would you listen to this here? It is obvious that this symbol did not originate with Islam. The symbol of the crescent moon and star is extremely ancient and was present in every ancient pagan culture of the world. It is very powerful and important al alchemy, an alchemy symbol uh, relating to the third eye and the sixth chakra as well as to the feminine aspect of the soul. Islam stole this and used it as a primary symbol. Along with the symbol, Islam also stole the ancient pagan lunar calendar of the area. This works directly with the feminine alchemical energies, which are manipulated to keep the ignorant followers enslaved. See, they follow alchemy. Alchemy, what's witchcraft? I mean, it's sorcery. It's more, more, more specifically, it's sorcery. Alchemy's goal is to create the man, the final, the, 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 well, they're going to turn a golem into a man is what they're going to do, and they're going to breathe into it life. And I, I think what they're really showing you is how they, they're, they're trying to get to is the Antichrist. They're trying to show you the rise of the Antichrist through alchemy, um, which, you know, I don't have time to go down that road. Anyway, but, um, but, but understand this. I, I want to see, and Brother Aaron's going to work with me here in the future, and I'm actually, I'm going to have some, some, some I'm going to be able to hit a button on this, right, Brother Aaron? We're going to work this out to where I can hit a button on this, and we'll have, a, we'll have one, Brother Paul, we're going to have one of them fancy uh, slide. I'm telling you, we're going big time here, man. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to pull this thing down and have, and have some pictures up there for you. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to touch the picture, and it's going to go, boop. It's going to be up there, and you'll be like, wow. Anyway, isn't that nice, Brother Aaron? Telling you, I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, but you've seen the crescent moon, but you can see the crescent moon in ar in archaeology. You can see it all over the place. It's there. It's it's predates all the way back to Babylon. You can see it in Assyria. You can see it in the in the tablets anywhere. Just Google it. Just just type in the crescent moon and see the symbol. You've got to understand they're giving you hints and clues to who they are by the symbols they use. But that's they don't call themselves Islam though. They didn't call Babylon. They call, they don't have to. They're using the same method of communication. That is a method of communication that is telling you what they stand for. And you can find it. You can find it. Muhammad did not invent Islam. The Vatican, did. The Vatican borrowed it from paganism, took it back, repackaged it, and sold it to a bunch of people out, in the, out, in, out on the sand. When they, now, another, another thing. When they take the cookie god out of the Pope's place... In the, he places it, the Pope places that cookie god inside of a crescent moon. So, when you know that weird looking thing he has that he holds up that, I don't know, it's probably some weird scepter or something, I don't know what it is, he's a weirdo. But anyway, he's got this cookie thing and he sets, he sets the, and he says that this is the host, he calls it, that's not spooky enough. It's the host and he says it's Jesus in there, right? And he's going to take Jesus and he sets it into the female crescent. The male into the female. That's all the further I'm going with that, but do you understand? What are they picturing? They're picturing the same thing, the sons of God and the daughters of men. They're picturing the same thing. It's the same religion. Islam did not invent that crescent moon. That crescent moon came from Rome. They were using it. They got it from Mystery Babylon. They use the same symbol. And Islamic people are so deceived, they try to say, just like Roman Catholics, well, we don't bow down to these things, or we don't follow any images, or we don't. Yes, you do. You follow images. You follow a crescent moon that you got from Rome, and you don't even know it. The sun and the moon, this represents the generative principle. By the way, did you know the God of the Lodge is Allah? And they have the moon and the stars. I'm going to see if I can find a picture of that for you here real quick. But they have the moon and the stars. The God of the Lodge is Islam over there. And, uh, and they use they use the same thing. They use, they use the same thing of, as Islam does. I want you to see this here. I want to show you this. Now this is a lodge. You see the crescent moon here? You see that? Or you see you see the you see the pyramids? You see the crescent moon? You see who these people are? Okay, look at this. You see that? 
Okay. Now this is a this is a a, a, a Mason Lodge, a Shriners Lodge. This is a Freemason Mason Lodge meeting in Cairo in Egypt in 1940 under the portrait of King Farouk the first. He was the king of Egypt from 1936 to 1952. President Abdul Nasser 1954 to 1970. Mohammed Anwar Sadat 1970 to 1981 were also members of this lodge. This is the ancient Egyptian order and Arab noble of the Mystic Shrine. These are these are these are masons, okay. And I'll show you these pictures later if you want to see them. But but these are masons, okay. Wait a minute, Muslims that are shriners. Whoops, Muslims that are shriners. How does that work? I thought there was. I thought they couldn't follow anything, any symbols or signs, brother Paul. I thought they didn't do any of that stuff. I thought that wasn't what they were about. I thought they were. They 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 didn't go for any of that idolatry stuff. Listen, folks, it's the same mystery religion. It's the same thing. It was started by Babylon. It was started by Rome. It's the same thing. That's the God of the Lodge. How about this? The Star of Islam. You ever seen that before? That's another symbol. I thought they didn't have any stars or any. I thought they didn't have any images or anything like that. They didn't do any of that stuff. Here you go. This is this is the eight-pointed star of Islam. It's called the Star of Islam. See that? It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's looking at me like, what is that? All right, that's the that's the Star of Islam. Why eight points? Well, symbols mean something. They do. They, they mean something. You believe that, don't you? As much as you've seen of, of, of things that, that we've studied and talked about, let me tell you what that eight-pointed star is. That eight-pointed star is a pagan symbol that was associated with the great power throughout the ancient world. It was the symbol of the goddess Ashtaroth. Huh. The symbol of the goddess Ashtaroth. And also the symbol of Venus. It represents the heart chakra. Something other than 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 um, than pure Islamic Muhammad and Allah wouldn't that be something different? Hmm. I don't know. How about this one? I got another one for you. How about the all-seeing eye in Islam? Now, surely that wouldn't be in there, would it? Surely the all-seeing eye would not be in Islam. Well, I'm going to show you a picture. Of the all seeing eye in Islam. Give me a second here, let me find it. I know it's here somewhere. Here it is. This right here is the all seeing eye in Islam. Okay? This is the all, you see it from there? You see it? It's called the Hamza, actually. What in the world does that mean? Well, I'm going to show. I'm going to tell you what it means here. That Hamza, I think I'm pronouncing it right anyway. Yeah, I am. Also, Romanized the Hamza meaning 
5 is a palm-shaped amulet popular throughout the Middle East and North Africa and commonly used in jewelry and wall hangings, depicting the open right hand, an image recognized and used as a sign of protection in many societies throughout history. The Hamza is believed to provide defense against the evil eye. The symbol predates Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In Islam, it is also known as the Hand of Fatima. Remember that name, Fatima? So named to commemorate Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. The Levantine Christians call it the Hand of Mary. They're not really Christians, by the way. For the Virgin Mary, Jews refer to it as the Hand of Miriam in remembrance of biblical Miriam, sister of Moses. In Islam, the Hamza is called the Hand of Fatima in honor of one of the daughters of the Prophet Muhammad. Some say in an Islamic tradition, the five fingers represent the five pillars of Islam. In Old Turkish, this sign is called... Uh, with pence meaning hand of five, the household of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. This relates the, to the belief that God exists in everything, they say. That's why they have that hand with the all-seeing eye and its five fingers. They have it held up there, and they have the eye in the middle. This relates to the belief that God exists in everything. Another meaning of the symbol relates to the sky god, Horus. Oh. It refers to the eye of Horus, which means man cannot escape from the eye of conscience. It says that the sun and the moon are the eyes of Horus. Hand of Fatima also represents femininity. It is referred to as the woman's holy hand. It is to believe they have extraordinary characteristics that use to protect people from evil and other dangers. Now, why would Islam have the same mystery, Babylon the Great, eye? Why would they have that symbol? The daughter of Muhammad. Why would they have that symbol? You know, the Bible talks about that idle shepherd, though, that guy that's watching. It says in Zechariah eleven seventeen, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. He's only got one eye. The left eye. You see... These are, out, these are external signs that Islam is nothing more than a mystery religion. It's nothing more than, than Babylon. It's nothing more than created. Because why would you use these symbols that are not, they're not biblical? I mean, they're not right. They're not godly. Um, why would they use those symbols? And Muhammad had nothing to do with any of those things. Why would they have those? I mean, why, where did Muhammad get those things from? Where did he get that from, the all-seeing eye? Where would Muhammad get that from? Where did he get the crescent moon from? Where did he get those external symbols? signs from? Why does he believe in the immaculate? Why do, why do Muslims believe in the immaculate conception? Why do they believe that? Strange. I'm going to prove to you they do by Muhammad's own words. Father, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for your words. Thank you for the truth, Lord. Lord, we just pray that maybe some Muslims will hear this and come out of that and be saved. Maybe some Christians will get educated enough to understand the history of Islam and be able to use that to reach others for Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.